Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to DAS for Vibe Cultural Arts Incubators, tipping back and tilting forward. 25 years gone too soon Zoom series, organized by the DCAI team, which includes Amanda Kovash, Adaya Lindsay, Kim Yantis, Sarah M.K. Moody, and for this Zoom, Michelle Parchment. I am Rosie Gordon Wallace, and I'm your convener for this evening's conversation, Natural Entanglements. Our moderator is Dr. Alex Pierre, our resident scholar, in conversation with Rita Clint, Bruna Matura, and a fabulous video performance artist, Yassine Fahl. Thank you for signing on. We will mind the time and also ask Amanda to assist us with collecting your questions posted in the chat. We will leave 10 minutes at the end of the session to address the questions that may come up. And I also ask that you turn your video cameras up. We wanna see you all. Let's acknowledge the land on which we work. We would like to acknowledge that we do this work on ancestral, indigenous and traditional lands of the first peoples of Miami, the Tequesta and Seminole tribes, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself where we live and work as guests and pay respect to the elders past, present, and honor this original home of ours. It is my joy and pleasure to introduce you to Alex Peer, Dr. Alex Peer, our scholar and resident. Thank you, Rosie. Good evening, everyone, wherever you might be joining us from. And tonight, we really are uh, engaging in a transnational conversation. Uh, one of our artists, Rita Clint, is originally from uh, Helsinki, Finland. And I'm going to try, Rita, to say hello. Uh, that's the greeting in uh, Finnish. Nangadev for our friend uh, Rasi, I mean Yassin uh, Fal, who's uh, originally, or at least of Senegalese and Mauritanian descent, uh, American. A Kasaye who uh, Bruno, our friend from uh, Guadeloupe, as I indicated, this is what DVCA is all about. It's uh, the diaspora and its diversity uh, in the transnational. Uh, realm. All three artists are uh, DVCAI uh, connected. We've worked with them and continue to work with them. And uh, I'm not going to insult your intelligence. Uh, you have you received you know information on the artist. So uh, simply, I will simply point out that Rita is based in um, Texas. Um, she has a um, uh, degree, you know, she graduated from, uh, let me see here, uh, Florida Atlantic University with the BFA uh, uh, in, in art, the degree in art. Uh, friend Yasin is, is a graduate of uh, the Corcoran School of Arts and Design, you know, the George Washington University in Washington. And our friend Bruno, Bruno is based, so Bruno is, you know, at, currently in Guadalupe, Clint. Clint, I mean, Rita is in Texas and uh, Yasin is in DC. I am in uh, Atlanta, you know, and the rest of the team is in uh, Florida. Again, trans, it doesn't get more transnational than that. So my first question to all three um, artists is this, how does the relationship between the human body and the natural environment translate in your work? And uh, you will hear me speak both French and English because Bruno uh, understand a little bit of English, but I'm going to have to translate for him. So here's the same question in French. Donc Bruno, comment se manifeste la relation entre le corps humain et l'environnement dans ton travail? Again, how does the relationship between the human body and the natural environment translate in your work? And we're going to start with Yassine and watch the uh, uh, video, and then you know she'll walk us through. Uh, the, the process and the answer. Alors, <coughs> bonjour, bonjour à tout le monde. Attends. Merci. De... Bonjour. On, on commence avec. Euh, euh, yeah. Yeah. On commence avec. Yeah. <laughs> Désolé, j'ai oublié de traduire. Ça va?
beautiful piece. So, yeah, Sam, if you will, can you, you know, speak to the uh, entanglement between, you know, the nature and the human body, if you of will? Of course. So I, um, especially with this piece, I titled that piece, Sunitek de Faiwalangan. Donc, um, like, Sunitek is like our stillness flows. So Walangan is like a word used specifically to describe like the flow of a river. So thinking about the baobab tree being almost 100% water, it's like 90, it's between 80 and 90% of fully just water, connecting that to the human body, you know, and thinking about our, like what is water to us in that sense? So it's our blood. So thinking about the tension that kind of exists between, you know, how water exists outside of us versus how it exists on the inside, you know? And like the difference in intimacy for me is something that I really wanted to explore in that piece. And because of the fact that I work with ceramics a lot, I work with dirt, water is very much like a key process, you know, like it erodes, but it also, you know, solidifies the thing. So thinking about kind of how to navigate that. And I like to use the body as a means of connecting with the natural environment. So I usually start with a material and I do investigations and I kind of think about, okay, what are the key components materially that I physically connect with? And then building the work from there and then creating like relationships of like manipulation mm -hmm. between the work and myself and myself and the work, you know? So the impact comes, you know, it's like, a, it's like a mutual experience kind of, you know, whatever the work is experiencing, I'm also experiencing. Mm -hmm. So kind yeah. of creating that. Right. Yeah. The Thank you so much. So does gender, you know, impact that, that relationship? I think that it's something very interesting for me to navigate. I've had to deal with it a lot. And thinking about this piece, especially because it was a whole year long project. Mm -hmm. It was done after coronavirus. So I was using, I was planning on using like multiple performers and then it came down to just me. And then I think politically, it's always been a situation for me to navigate in my work being a black female. Mm -hmm. and being of Senegalese descent, you know, and being American at the same time. So it's like a lot of intersectionality, you know? Right. And, and I think that it's important just to like, in the event as a performer, centering the black woman to me is not a problem. If anything, it just makes, you know, it kind of completes the concept almost. Mm -hmm. I do like to, you know, not play much on gender though. Sometimes it's very useful and sometimes it really is a tool for the concept. And then sometimes it becomes something that I want to distance myself from. So like covering my face with the pots and kind of trying to, you know, disappear almost, but still be present. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Rita. I'm going to turn to you. And uh, you are seeking to keep alive the planet's, you know, wild places. Your creations mm -hmm. are fantastical sanctuaries that foster reflection. So uh, we, uh, just with Yasin, we're gonna look at one of your, or several of your pieces, and if you can walk us through, you know, uh, that, that, that concept. Right. Um, this one's titled Aria. And so it's like a tree singing to uh, our environment. Um, I, uh, I feel like, uh, well, nature and our connection to the earth is what inspires my work and always has, mm -hmm. along with mythology and uh, things like that. Um, so I, in my art, I like to think that it gives, at least it gives me a place to reflect and wander uh, and for others too, to take a breath, slow down and, and view nature, you know, as beautiful as it is and connected to us. Um, so uh, many of my paintings uh, are abstracted landscapes, sort of dreamscapes. Um, I've always been fascinated by I mean, fairy tales and things like that from when I was a young child and all kinds of mythologies and uh, uh, world epic stories. And so, uh, uh, and a lot of them are like the viewers on this threshold, just peering in and ready, to, really ready to go in. Uh, and some are from a distance. So I have read. Like read some are more like maybe from even further I'm distance. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sometimes I go deep with it, like right into the branches, the roots, the flowers, um, insects that are in there. And uh, mm -hmm. I find it as, it's a, to me, it's a healing mechanism and hopefully for others too. Um, and I found that each viewer reflects on it very personally based on their own experiences in life. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, but universally, most people that, speak to me about my art, find it that it is 
a sanctuary mm -hmm. and a place to wander. And so a, a, a place to be, you know, with their own thoughts. Okay. Um, All right. know, the, these are dress figures. Um, I did a body of work called Gaia's Wedding for a solo show a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was a concept of Gaia uh, as Mother Earth coming back to the Earth to say, stage an elaborate wedding to renew her vows mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to remind us to take care of the delicate balance. Right. So that's one of those pieces. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as wild places I was influenced in, uh, in Finland, Lapland mm -hmm. is an extremely wild and beautiful, right. untouched place. Uh, and then um, Indonesia was another one that influenced me. Some of the Indonesian islands like uh, mm -hmm. Bali, Lombok, and uh, Bhutan, where the, the orange, I mean, the orang uh, orangutans, or, I don't know, there's something really wild. I, I would like to see that all preserved. Mm -hmm. I'm very worried that it's not. Okay. Uh, this painting that you're viewing right now is inspired by Bali. Mm -hmm. uh, and the lotus flower, which is very important to them and their culture and uh, spirituality. Um, the houses that you see there um, are, uh, they're three-legged most of the time because I feel like I'm a global nomad. So mm -hmm. if I put that, if I planted that house into the ground, it would fall over. But if it's three-legged, I can float through time and space freely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's kind of, you know, where I am with that preserving the this right. fantastic landscape. landscape. Yes. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Rita. Uh, Bruno, uh, your creation is supported by your observation of nature, humans, and their cosmogony. So my question to you is this, what conclusion have you arrived at uh -huh. looking at the intersection between the three elements? humans, nature, and the origins of uh, the universe. Donc, Bruno, ta créativité s'appuie sur l'observation de la nature, des humains, et de leur cosmogonie. Alors, ma question, c'est, quelle conclusion est-ce que tu tires de l'interaction entre ces trois groupes, la nature, l'origine, uh, les, les humains, la nature, et l'origine de l'univers? Bonjour. Donc, tu peux répondre à... OK. Et merci beaucoup euh, à Devey Sillé pour euh, l'opportunité qui m'est donnée de pouvoir euh, expliquer un petit peu mon travail et de paraître euh, à l'intérieur de, de cet espace. Alors, mon, mon micro okay. est muet, non C'est bon Non, c'était celui-là. Voilà. D'accord. Donc, au travers, au travers de, de, de cette observation, euh, j'ai voulu me recentrer euh, tout premièrement sur l'idée qu'on vit dans un espace euh, sans avoir euh, complètement euh, une maîtrise que l'on n'aura jamais d'ailleurs, mais sans avoir une maîtrise avec cette modernité qui est autour de nous et qui nous okay. empêche en fait de réaliser oh. pleinement. Ah, Donne-nous donne le temps de traduire. Oui. Je crois que, je crois que vraiment c'est mieux si tu expliques maintenant, quoi, si tu dis. OK. Vas-y. Vas-y, Bruno. Non, ça va, ça va tu, prendre du temps, quoi. En gros, tu expliqueras en gros. Mm -hmm. Donc, en fait, je, pars, je suis parti d'un chaos, de l'idée qu'il y avait un chaos autour de moi, un chaos humain, mm -hmm. euh, un chaos autour de peut-être des origines, So the starting point here is the chaos, okay, as far as the origin of, you know, human being. That's my starting, you know, the starting point, chaos. Mm -hmm. De par euh, notre histoire, de also, par euh, le vide que nous avons eu à un moment donné de notre histoire. And also um, using our history and uh, the fact that at some point there was a void in our history. Et de cette idée à la fois de blackout et de reconstruction. And the idea of a blackout and then uh, rebuilding, reconstructing. Voilà, donc euh, j'ai commencé un moment à, à travailler en faisant euh, d'abord un chaos au sol. So I, I started uh, my work with creating, if you will, chaos on, on the floor. Of the de system. manière à livrer les énergies 
que je ressentais et donc je tourne autour de la toile au sol so that i could release the all the energies you know that i felt within so i start you know with you know uh, the work on the ground et je me suis rendu compte qu'en fait tout cela contribuait à un rituel and i realized that all of this was part of a ritual uh, parce qu'on ne voyait jamais, je ne voyais jamais en fait la toile dans son ensemble à because cause I, de l'angle de point de vue. Ok, because as I work, remember the work is on the ground, I could never see it in, you know, I could never have a full view of it because again I was moving around, so I, I could only see parts and pieces or angles if you will. Et mm -hmm. ça correspond pour moi à, la, à une partie de la vision humaine que l'on peut avoir. And this represents, you know, uh, the vision that a human being can have. Donc, quand j'ai commencé à, à vouloir travailler en remontant ma toile à la verticale. So once I started, you know, uh, uh, lifting up the, you know, the, the art piece, you know, from the ground and sit it for, you know, vertically. Uh, j'ai uh, eu le besoin de la faire pivoter sans cesse pour retrouver une harmonie. I felt the need to do the exact same thing that I was doing on the ground, you know, moving, you know, the painting around so I could feel that energy. Donc, je peins sans cesse en retournant ma toile et uh, ça me permet en même temps de me sentir en lévitation, en fait, au-dessus au de ce chaos. So I constantly uh, pain, you know, moving, you know, uh, the... Uh, the painting, the canvas, if you will, and which creates, you know, a, a, a state of levitation, and that's where I'm getting my energy from. Et uh, je me suis aussi rendu compte que dans ce type de travail, de mouvement, uh, il y a uh, ce que l'on voit d'une façon que l'on ne retrouve pas de l'autre. And I also realized that, uh, you know, using that technique, what happens is that you see things one way, Uh, but you can never go back to that moment and, and capture it again. Et uh, c'est exactement en fait ce que j'essaye de faire, mais avec l'idée que l'humain uh, ne regarde pas avec son esprit. And that's exactly what I'm trying to reproduce, you know, with the thought that uh, a human being is not looking when we when we watch, we're not looking with our ne regarde pas avec son esprit. Doesn't look. Uh, through his mind, his or her mind. Mais que il regarde de façon horizontale avec ceux qu'il a autour de lui. But he usually tend to, you know, to cast an horizontal look, okay, taking into account what is his or her surrounding. Uh, même lorsque mes toiles sont présentées, par exemple, telles qu'on les regarde là. Even when my paintings are, you know, displayed the way we're looking at them now, currently. Uh, on ne voit toujours en fait qu'une partie de ce qu'elles peuvent représenter puisque un carré aura huit points de vue différents. Ok, well, you can only see one part of, you know, what they totally uh, represent because there are a square, there's four, I mean, eight parts, huit parts, c'est ça? Oui. To a square, so looking, you only see one, uh, one of them. Un carré et uh, sous square. forme de losange. And also a losange. Ah. Merci, merci Bruno. Um, deuxième question, second question. Uh, I see your work, you know, all three works as, um, you know, eco-criticism or post-colonial ecology uh, in the sense that colonization and anti-colonial struggles are rooted in land and territoriality. France Fanon uh, captures this best when he says, and I quote, for a colonized people, the most essential value because the most concrete is first and foremost the land, the land which will bring them bread and above all, dignity. So how is this, the question for you now, how is this quote uh, applicable to the spaces you currently inhabit uh, or originated from or resided? Uh, as I indicated, Bruno is uh, in Guadeloupe. Um, Yassine, we mentioned your Senegalese, Mauritanian, you know, background, but you're based in D.C. Rita, originally from Finland, but you've lived in Florida. You're based in Texas, but you've traveled, you know, uh, through Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. So, question en français, Bruno. Je vois donc votre travail à tous les trois comme un exemple d'écocritique et d'écologie postcoloniale 
dans le sens où les luttes anticoloniales sont enracinées dans la terre et la territorialité. Fanon le résume bien quand il déclare, et je cite, « Pour les peuples colonisés, la valeur la plus importante, parce qu'elle est la plus concrète, est avant tout la terre. La terre qui va leur fournir du pain et par-dessus tout la dignité. » Donc question pour vous tous et toi, comment est-ce que la citation s'applique au territoire où vous habitez couramment ou bien où vous êtes né la Guadeloupe pour toi, Bruno, le Sénégal, la Mauritanie euh, pour euh, Yacine, qui est basé en, à Washington, la Finlande, pays d'origine de Rita, qui a vécu en Floride, qui vit actuellement au Texas, mais qui a voyagé en Asie, en Europe et au Moyen-Orient. Do I need to repeat the question? Or you got it, guys? No, we got it. All right. <laughs> Yes, you wanna, you wanna. No, so yes, I'll start. Et on va te faire travailler, je te jure, parce que je peux pas. Like I can't type as quick as Bruno. Bruno's <laughs> like Alex is gonna be working all night. It's um, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that I feel like when I think about land in general, it's like I associate land with the history of so many bodies. You know. Alors quand je pense à la terre. Euh... Quand, je, ouais, quand je pense à la terre, je pense à l'histoire de beaucoup de corps, quoi. Donc je pense à ma famille. I think about my family. I think about bloodlines. I think about you know the type of communities that get built in these areas and why. So in Senegal, there's like a practice, um, ethnically wise, for the Serer people to like build communities around the baobab trees and like name them. You know what I mean? So that's something very interesting and thinking about like how connected they are in their daily lives to the ground, but what the ground connects them to. So like, it's very much about history. Okay. That's what it really makes me think of. Uh -huh. Donc, il dit, pour résumer, Bruno, que euh, quand on passe à la terre ou elle pense aux humains, elle pense à la relation entre les deux. Et il y a une tradition au Sénégal, non seulement pour Bruno, mais pour vous autres euh, qui donc, sont francophones. Euh, il y a une tradition au Sénégal où on plante un, un, un baobab. Okay? Donc, c'est pour signifier en fait cette relation entre les humains et la terre. Mm -hmm. uh, Rita? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, your specific question to me was about residing in these places and how, uh, uh, if I see a difference in ways that people relate to the land and their territories and their yeah. sense of self. Mm -hmm. So um, initially, I think I get my first connection to nature from Finland and the education I received there. Um, people in Finland live very, very close to nature. They have a deep love and respect for it. Um, and uh, just about everyone in Finland that lives in a big city has a summer cottage in one of our, at one of our hundreds of thousands of lakes. <laughs> and they spend as much time there as possible. Give me a second to pray for Bruno. Oh. Oui, donc, ce que dit Rita, c'est que donc elle part de la Finlande, donc la relation des Finlandais à la nature. Elle dit que en Finlande, on est très proche de la nature et que euh, toutes les familles ou la plupart des familles ont une maison de campagne entre, entre guillemets, une maison euh, donc euh, qui se trouve en général dans la nature par rapport au centre urbain. Donc ça, ça fait partie de de, de, de la tradition de, de l'art de vivre en, en Finlande. Keep going. Okay, um, in, in my native Finland, uh, nature education and environmental education are extremely important, starting in elementary and middle school. Um, uh, so the education is based on their students' outdoor experience. There's a lot of really emphasize outdoor play mm -hmm. and stuff like that, especially for the little ones. And, uh, and that is to, to strengthen their um, positive relationship to nature. And, and their respect for it. Okay. Uh, according uh, to a lot of research, uh, it's a positive relationship with nature is a basis of, of environmental res responsibility. Okay. And, uh, uh, en, donc en Finlande, les enfants au euh, niveau dans le milieu scolaire, ils reçoivent une éducation donc concernant euh, l'écologie, la, la, la nature. Euh, ils reçoivent de, donc de l'instruction dans, dans, dans ce domaine. Et donc l'idée c'est que euh, cet enseignement sur l'écologie crée en fait de la res responsabilise les, les, les citoyens, on commence avec les enfants très tôt pour qu'une euh, fois devenus adultes ils puissent continuer donc euh, ces pratiques mm -hmm. yeah. 
And so uh, orienteering is a required subject in schools. So you are given a compass, mm -hmm. you learn how to use it, and they, they basically put you out in the middle of a forest mm -hmm. and you are required to find these compass points. And uh, through that, you, you, people develop a, a highly confident sense of being with nature mm -hmm. and how to navigate it. Mm -hmm. uh, you're taught about all the plants, trees, berries, how to identify the different types of mushrooms and not kill yourself by eating the wrong one, you know, or, and, and the berries and, and, and such. Uh, uh -huh. So, uh -huh. yeah. Donc, uh, uh, dans, dans l'enseignement, donc, euh, on, en, on apprend aux enfants à s'orienter. Donc, euh, il y a un exercice, donc c'est un cours, et il y a un exercice où on leur donne un compas, et donc ils doivent s'orienter dans, dans la nature. Euh, on, ils ont un objectif à atteindre. Donc, ça, ça fait partie donc, de, de l'instruction et ça fait partie donc, de la vie des, uh, des Finlandais. Mm -hmm. Et Marie, yeah, and then, uh, excuse me? No, I served in the army and we had a similar, we had a similar exercise. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, but yes, so uh, uh, I just, I mean, as children, we even, we go out in the forest with, um, with my grandmother, you know, we went, you pick berries, you just learn how to be with it. And that just becomes a deep part of the culture there. So that was really my initial why. I didn't even know why I was creating the art that I was creating, but it, it just comes from that. And then uh, the landscapes change according to the different countries that I remember. I was perhaps a little too young when I lived in Iran to really relate, I mean, to answer that question specifically, but uh, I do still remember how amazing it was going from a very cold and, uh, you know, lush kind of Nordic landscape to almost a desert. Mm -hmm. uh, but to see how proud the people were. And I remember them washing their beautiful Persian carpets by the rivers and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, Indonesia then was another very lush landscape. And uh, especially in Bali, uh, how people, they just relate their spirituality to the earth that they walk on, you know, it's, so that's how they remain connected, so. Mm -hmm. I'm still figuring it out in Texas. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Ben, let us know when you, when you get there. Uh, <laughs> Bruno, Bruno est-ce que tu peux, uh, donc, toujours par rapport à cette question, uh, préciser un peu donc, pour, uh, pour le public, uh, comment est-ce que les Guadeloupéens, uh, quelle est la nature de la relation entre les Guadeloupéens et l'île au sens physique. Uh, so I'm asking Bruno to, uh, uh, you know, share with us how what how do Guadeloupeans relate to the physicality of the island? Bruno? Alors, de mon point de vue, uh, from my point of view, les nos anciens étaient uh, tournés vers la terre, vers ce qu'elle renferme much more in, in sync with the earth and all that it brings to human beings. Et leur enseignement était encore dans le domaine de l'initiation. And the teaching was based on the concept of initiation. Sans qu'on s'en rende compte. Uh, even without people realizing it. Voilà, de mon point de vue personnel, uh, je suis né sur, enfin, c'est une terre de feu. I was born on an island of uh, 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 fire. Elle est née, elle est née, elle est née de volcan. Oh, okay. Which was, you know, it's the uh, the island is the result of the creation of the result is the. Uh, voilà. Avec tout ce qui s'y trouve, c'est une. Mm -hmm. C'est une terre qui bouge. And it moves. It's constantly, you know, shifting and moving. C'est une terre euh, balayée par les alizés, mais en même temps fouettée aussi par les, euh, par les cyclones. OK, so uh, because it's an island, you know, surrounded by water and, you know, so there's always a breeze flowing. But, you know, the uh, flip side of this is it's prone to um, uh, hurricanes. Et la situation qui est la nôtre euh, entend aussi que, que ex, entre guillemets, ex-colonie, c'est de se rendre compte. Mm -hmm. Vas-y, vas-y. C'est de se rendre compte que euh, nous avons un ici et nous avons un ailleurs. 
And because we're in Ireland, former French colony, uh, one of the, the end result of, you know, how we situate ourselves is being, you know, uh, fully conscious, aware of the fact that we have, we're in between, we have here and a there. Here, the island, and there, France, some 8,000 kilometers away. Mm -hmm. Donc, nous avons toujours à tourner notre regard vers euh, ce qu'on pourrait appeler la frontière la frontière de 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 l'horizon. Okay. So we're constantly having to have a look towards what he calls, you know, the uh, the horizon's frontier. Donc euh, d'où encore une fois le fait de 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 tourner autour de nous, d'avoir un regard qui se propage tout autour de nous et de devoir toujours essayer de regarder les choses à la verticale plus en hauteur quoi. Mm -hmm. Aussi, so we, bien, aussi bien en profondeur aussi, mm -hmm. de nous-mêmes, mm -hmm. mais euh, de ce qu'il y a tout autour de nous pour peut-être aller plus loin. Et euh, la végétation, le peu de moyens qu'avaient nos parents, mm -hmm. euh, savaient profiter de tout cela. So again, given our, you know, our positioning as human beings and citizens living on, you know, on an island, but being part of a country, that is 8,000 kilometers away, as I indicated before, we, we Guadalupians, we are constantly having to do this, you know, looking at where we are, you know, geographically, the immediate surrounding, but also having in the back of our mind that other part of our being. And so what is, you know, does is really calling you to, you know, look you know, outside, but also inside of yourself. And again, given the, uh, the uh, the means that the you know, limited means that our parents you know our forebearers had uh you have to appreciate you know what they've been able to uh, to do and to um share with us in terms of our appreciation of of, of the island mm -hmm. et je dirais aussi que en fait on, on est constamment on est constamment à la fois dans la bénédiction de notre de notre de notre lieu mm -hmm. et euh, aussi dans la rudesse de ce qui arrive à chaque fois que euh, nous avons des catastrophes euh, qui arrivent. Quoi. Mm -hmm. So we we find ourselves in that situation where we are blessed and we recognize that we are blessed living on an island with all you know the the the, uh, the positives, but also you know every time we're hit by a natural disaster, be it a hurricane or a tsunami, we also remind of the flip side of of it all. Merci, merci Bruno. Um, I'd like to touch uh, on the spiritual because, you know, uh, all three of you have mentioned that uh, the spiritual element contained in the works, you know, looking at, you know, your work, whether uh, uh, seen your performances or, you know, drawing, you know, same thing in, in, in uh, Rita. Um, there, you know, uh, I'd like for us to talk about, you know, the belief systems or customs, you know, that inform your practice and reflection on nature and the environment. Let me repeat that again. Uh, can you talk about the belief systems and customs that inform your practice and reflection on nature slash the environment? Donc Bruno, j'aimerais parler maintenant de la spiritualité contenue dans votre travail à tous les trois. Est-ce que tu peux parler des croyances et pratiques qui influencent ta pratique et tes réflexions sur la nature et l'environnement? Um, oui, tu peux. Oui. D'accord. Donc, en fait, lié, lié à cela, euh, euh, nous, sommes, nous sommes à la fois liés de ce que notre histoire nous a donné, euh, du fardeau de notre histoire. So we part in part en même temps, des bénédictions de cette histoire. OK, we part in part of the history that we inherited. And again, I'm, I'm you know, on one hand, there are blessings, but also there are, you know, the drawbacks to those blessings. Mm -hmm. Alors, fardeau dans le sens où, par exemple, tout ce qui peut être uh, magique ou religieux. And the idea of burden, when I talk about burden, I talk about, you know, specifically the belief systems, African descended belief systems. Mm -hmm. uh, mais qui peut être aussi perçu uh, comme étant, en fait, uh, une voie originelle. But they can also, some can see them as the original way, if you will. Et vu euh, de manière, euh, on va dire, négative, 
But if you look at it uh, simplement the parce que il y a aussi un, un judéo-chrétien qui s'exerce énormément sur uh, sur mm. qui nous sommes. So, but if you look at it from a, uh, a negative standpoint, or the negative, you know, element to the negative uh, consideration comes from the Judeo-Christian background. Donc, ma considération a été pour moi. Uh, lorsque le, le cyclone Hugo est arrivé et que je l'ai subi. Mm -hmm. So, a few, uh, in, I think it was uh, uh, 1989, the island was visited by the uh, hurricane Hugo. Hugo. So, uh, this is how I responded to it. Mm -hmm. uh, de comprendre uh, pourquoi il y avait des gens dans le passé ou par le passé ou encore maintenant qui, qui vivait dans l'animisme. So I tried when you know we were we sustained the hurricane I made it a point to try to understand why people uh, before us had embraced animism. <coughs> Donc moi je n'avais jamais entendu de vent qui pouvait avoir un grondement comme euh, comme un fauve. Uh, I never heard of a wind, you know, that could growl like a, a you know, a feline, an animal. I never heard of that before. Et uh, j'ai eu à, à me remettre à considérer uh, l'importance uh, entière, mais vraiment entière, de la nature autour de nous, dont nous faisons partie. So this, you know, caused me to really reconsider, revisit my understanding of nature uh, and the in the environment. La différence c'est que on n'est plus non plus dans uh, l'ignorance de ce qui uh, agit autour de nous. So today we're fully cognizant of all the elements involved. Mm -hmm. Donc c'est pour ça que j'aime à parler d'un animisme moderne. So that's why you know I choose to talk about modern animism. Mm -hmm. Merci. Voilà. Uh -huh. Merci Bruno. Uh, Yacine? Oui, je peux répondre. Um, oui. Alors, je vais parler du animisme. Donc, uh, Sénégalais, Sénégalais, uh, in Senegal, everybody is mostly Muslim, you know? Mostly mm. Sufi from what I, what I understand. And there's a big Murid Brotherhood practice of the Baifal and their like religious disciples mm -hmm. um, in the community. And there's like a strong religious belief system and way of connecting to the community using Islam. But what's interesting about Senegal is that this type of animism that Bruno was just sharing comes from that pre-colonial um, polytheism, you know, and thinking about like what elements have what effect on the body and like what, like their power really being something that is like um, associated with like the essence of spirit. So. In Senegal, what you see more and more is like Islam and that polytheistic perspective of nature and of natural elements kind of fusing together, mm -hmm. you know, especially like in terms of like the bifold practices. So they'll be like singing or like, you know, rubbing themselves in dirt and beating themselves as they pray and things like that. So you see kind of like wild examples of people interacting with natural materials just as a way of connecting with God. So you think about, um, I did a piece looking for God And there was, and uh, in Islam, you do your wudu, you clean yourself with water, but there's also a practice, there's the tayammum, so you can do it with dirt, you can do it with sand as a supplement. And it's still this idea of like the, like any natural element being something of like, it has the power to purify or clean, you know, mm -hmm. um, and like connect with the human body in a specific way, spiritually. Mm -hmm. So that's a very large aspect and interest of my work, you know, especially thinking about like, Islam and like the tension between that and you know older religions in um, Senegal. So mm -hmm. it's very interesting to see how they touch each other mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a lot of the time, you know. And I did a piece looking for God, but thinking about the body as that um, as that natural material, though, as a means of connecting with God. So it's always like you know before any religious practice, anything, even um, there's like a there's a fighting style in Senegal as well with these big dudes, the big wrestlers. Wow. Uh -huh. you know no. <laughs> But, um, yeah so it's like even them like there's a whole practice before they fight of you know ritually putting you know milk or dirt or sand or you know and like covering themselves in that and doing rituals and like praying but to get in contact with this sense of otherness but it's always through the body 
Right. So I yeah. Think I'm just looking for God using my head, you know, and thinking about God as like and religion and all that as something unseen. In the same sense as animism kind of touches on that. It's like what you can touch, but what's there that you can't see that's still active. And then thinking about like, okay, the unseen. So like not being able to use my sight and using my body to navigate, you know, my surroundings. Mm -hmm. So all right. thank you very much, Jesse. And so Rita, we're gonna to turn to you and then we'll open it up for questions. So Rita. Okay, okay the, the spiritual references that I borrow from. Uh -huh. And uh, well, first I wanted, I thought it was very interesting when Jesse was talking about this ritual of cleansing. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Finland, we have the sauna, oh, yeah. which is very much rooted in our culture. Mm -hmm. And we get a bunch of birch branches that we tie together and we beat ourselves and uh, each other in the sauna to release the aromas and to open up the skin and just your pores and you know just uh then that's our ritual cleansing and if it's in there after that we jump out and into a frozen lake that we've drilled a hole in <laughs> or, or in the yeah. snow right, right. And, yes and then you know and also like you know i lived in a cultures you know of uh, muslim where the washing of the feet was always very important so things like that um and in my own work i uh i refer to i borrow from like earth mother concepts and like all things are from her come from her or return to her and that kind of thing and uh i like to study historical and cultural phenomena you know uh how fairy tales and mythology kind of enriches people spiritually and gives you your first sort of foundations to explore your own maybe uh and how you how you relate to that um shamanism mm -hmm. which i'm very fascinated by and uh just the altered states mm -hmm. uh of consciousness mm -hmm. and so there's a there's an altered state of consciousness in a lot of my work it's a it's a dreamscape or it's that hypnagogic state of just when you're about to fall asleep, not quite there, that you're somehow in this land. And I always try to keep that, that consciousness as long as I can before I actually fall asleep. So a lot of my work is in that crack between the reality and, and the dream. Um, so, and uh, a lot of my made up plants and uh, animals and stuff in my work are uh, uh, just about like mind altering plants. I make up my own, okay. you know, so <laughs> that's uh, what happens. So yeah. And uh, fairy tales influenced me as a child. I, I was obsessed with them. Living in Iran, it's not like we had television or I could do anything like that. So I read voraciously and I, I was living in my mind in this fairy fantasy world of British right. fairy tales. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And, thank, uh, so. thank you, Rita. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, questions. Again, we're opening up to our listenership, viewership. Uh, any, any questions for our three artists? Oh, okay. I see one from Josh. Fishman says, would any of you care to speak about your selections of colors and how they intersect with other elements you've discussed? Mm. So how do you choose colors and, how, and what's the intersection with other elements between those colors and what you've talked about? Uh-huh, Yasin? I work a lot with reds and natural colors. So the pots um, and a lot of iron. So thinking about just like the basis of things that are in the body, you know? So even the way red ochre is formed and how it's, it starts out yellow ochre and with heat and like erosion, it turns into red and it like gets that. So thinking about heat being something that you associate with that color and like the physical human body. Right. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I work a lot with green. Okay, green. Uh -huh. Yeah, lots of green. That's my connection to right. nature. Okay, and, and Joe's looking at the, at the word behind you, we see the green. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, uh -huh. I, I guess I could consider it my favorite color to work with. I feel the most comfortable and natural okay. with it. Okay, very good. Yeah. Bruno? Oh, pardon, Bruno, j'ai oublié de traduire. 
Euh, Est-ce que tu peux parler de la sélection des couleurs et euh, l'interaction entre ces couleurs et toutes les autres choses dont tu as parlé dans ton travail Alors, pour moi, de toute façon, les couleurs sont liées à tout ce que je vois, que j'identifie. Colors are, are connected to everything that I see and that I identify in nature. Elles doivent pouvoir danser, couler, être dance, comme le vent. Uh, they flow like the wind, so forth and so on. Uh -huh. Merci. Elles doivent être capables de, de vivre uh, comme je vois une, une goutte d'eau de rosée mm -hmm. ou uh, la rosée du matin, comme je vois les couleurs de mon ciel au fur et à mesure le matin. Uh, mm -hmm. Euh, prendre des proportions ou les couleurs du soir quoi. en fait okay. je fais en fonction de ce que j'aime avoir de, de ce qu'il y a autour de moi ok so and I incorporate all those elements in my in, in my painting you know from the rain drop uh, to uh, other uh, elements fine, fine in nature uh, second question from Lana Mayut would you consider yourselves as artists as muse of nature Universe or pure creators for what is around you. Uh, for Bruno, est-ce que vous vous considérez donc comme des artistes, comme des muses de la nature uh, ou de l'univers, ou alors comme des créateurs purs, uh, donc à partir de ce qui vous environne? So where do you guys stand? Uh, artists, muses of nature, universe, or pure creators? Um, I would uh, think that the relationship especially in my work between uh, my work or visual arts in general uh, and the environment is that the art mm -hmm. creates a, a new way of observing mm -hmm. and examining um, uh, and, and it can act as a model for seeing one's own everyday uh, mm -hmm. uh, surroundings in a new way, uh, right. enriching, enriching one's knowledge, um, experience, understanding. So a common ground I think exists Uh, between art and ecology, mm -hmm. uh, which, which may help end the long strife, uh, you know, the, the, between thought and intuition, science and art, okay. and possibly even between mankind and nature. And so the art, this way the artist's uh, connection to nature is, is uh, respectful, mm -hmm. almost sacral. Mm -hmm. um, so if, uh, it's as if the work refers to uh, like nature's own beauty and intelligence. <laughs> as its own uh, right. so it, it just opens our eyes to see something ordinary in a new that's around us every day but we see it in a new way um okay so, that, thanks Rita uh Yassine and Bruno c'est quoi la question uh est-ce que tu te considères comme une muse uh oh, comme okay, une okay, artiste okay. Don't, um, I think I don't see myself as I would say mainly a creator. I'm very interested in performances and residues of performances and like of work being something that works its way back into nature. Mm -hmm. So using natural materials like twine or rope and like grass and whatnot, things that I eventually decompose and become a part of. Okay. That's an interesting thing for me to, to, to explore for sure. All right, wonderful. Yeah. Bueno? Alors moi, je me considère uh, plutôt comme un filtre. Okay, I, que, I see myself uh, as a filter, if you will. And he's going to explain. Uh -huh. je, je me laisse baigner, imbiber de ce que je vois. I, whatever je whatever I, I see around me, you know, I uh, let that, you know, basically sink in and infuse me. Mm -hmm. Et uh, dans le secret de mon atelier, quand je peins. And in the uh, secret of my studio, when I paint. Uh, je, je laisse mes entités, je laisse mes entités exprimer ce qu'il y a à voir dans mon travail ou les directions plutôt. Ok, so I live dans mon travail. Right, so I leave my different entities, if you if you will, take the lead, you know, in terms of the work that I do. Um, merci Bruno, thank you. Um, we Rose, do we have time for one more question? I'm looking at the yes, time. Yes, we do. Uh, we do. Um, I see a question here from Petrona that I would love to read. Petrona yes. is one of the artists in intersectionality mm -hmm. um, that is now at the Harvey B. Gunn Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. I got that in. So Petrona says, Yassine, how has the virtual performance affected your, your practice without audience? Yeah, it's been something really interesting. I think it's like the new challenge. 
for forever. It really is like trying to figure out like how to not only like perform, it's how to perform and then not perform for the camera, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and then how to perform and also document it so people feel the performance. So it's almost like this push and pull of like divorcing myself from what it's going to look like and how it's going to exist virtually versus how I'm going to fully, uh, you know, just put all of myself into it when it's actually happening and not be so concerned with the logistics, you know? I think that it's something really interesting to think about. I've been working with a lot of new artists trying to kind of figure out how performance is going to exist, you know? And who's it for and what it's supposed to do off the camera versus on the camera. Right. So, And who, who decolonizes what? Right, um, there we go. Very good, yes. Dr. Dr. Alex, I'm not taking over, but I just no, 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 want no, to no, make please, sure please yes. we can get um, Eliza Mott's um, question from DC. I love these young people being on the call with us. This is so multi-generational. Mm-hmm. Question, <laughs> can you describe your creative process? Do you see your process and product as equally important or is one more important than the other? Please translate for me, Alex. Okay, comment est-ce que vous considérez? Do you mind repeating, Rosie, quickly? Um, it's in the chat under Eliza, but I will. Can mm. you describe your creative process? Oh, I just saw it. Bon, right. bon, toi, est-ce que tu peux décrire, oh, la question c'est pour tous les toits, est-ce yeah. que vous pouvez décrire votre processus de création? Et est-ce que vous, vous, est-ce que vous considérez ce processus et le produit final uh, d'importance égale ou pas? Okay. Ou est-ce que l'un d'entre eux est plus important que l'autre? Alors, si, si euh, je dois regarder euh, comment je peins, je peux peindre une toile rapidement. OK. In terms mais... of my process, I can, I can paint quickly. I can, it takes me no time at all to paint. Yeah. Mais euh, je, ne, je ne peux pas Je ne peux pas voir tout ce que mes entités me donnent à voir. But if I do temps. that, I can't really, you know, fully embrace everything that my entities, you know, uh, present to me, if you will. Donc, euh, je, je sais que euh, je peux six mois, un an, deux ans revenir sur une toile. Et en fait, finalement, pour moi, c'est un processus de continuité. Okay, so what, but the comfort comes from the fact that, you know, six months later, uh, uh, two months later, a year later, I can revisit, uh, uh, you know, one of my work and continue working on it. So that I, I take comfort in that. Et donc, ma, ma, mon, mon jugement uh, peut s'altérer mm-hmm. ou, au contraire, La maturité que je gagne dans le temps me permet de savoir comment je, devrais, je devais ouvrir les portes dans mon travail. Okay. Donc, en fait, c'est, uh-huh. c'est pareil. Right, OK, d'accord. So, I can either... At that, pas l'un de l'autre. D'accord. At that point, I can either, in, uh, you know, change altogether and come to the, to the work, you know, with a different point of view, or I can embrace, you know, the idea that I've have matured and incorporate that into into the uh, the process. So it's not for me. It's not an either or, uh, you know, question. Voilà. Et j'ai besoin. Je 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 conclue. Hein. J'ai besoin de voir la lumière du matin. I need I need the light, the morning light. Yeah. yeah. Celle du soir. And the evening light. <laughs> De manière à comprendre comment comment ça évolue. Okay, so that I can understand the evolution of the work. Wow, wow, wow. wow. Um, I'm going to jump to another question. Kurt from Suriname, Kurt Nahar. We affectionately call Kurt Harry. Mm -hmm. Kurt says um, he wants to talk about, in particular to Yassin, about the sacred tree. He says in Suriname, we have a sacred tree called the mahogany. Kurt, I know you want to have mahogany. We have mahogany in Jamaica too, okay? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Yassin, so Kurt wants us to talk about the sacred tree. And, and Rita and Bruno, what's your sacred tree in your country? Okay. Do you have a tree that's considered sacred? Uh-huh. From Kurt Nahan. Bruno, uh, l'un de nos artistes a posé la question à Yassin. Il dit que dans son cœur, il est du Suriname, il dit qu'au Suriname, ils ont le Mahogany. Et donc, il veut qu'elle parle un peu plus du, euh, du Baobab. 
Et euh, la question de Rosie, c'est que pour toi, Erita, est-ce que vous avez un arbre euh, qui est important pour vous? Yeah, so the tree is known as the tree of life. Um, and it's not just native in West Africa, it's parts of Australia as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe South Africa also. So it's found in like, you know, relatively the same climate, but uh, parts of the tree are used for fertility. You know, parts of the tree are used to get an abortion. At the same time, both things exist in the same material. Mm -hmm. There was a practice of burying griots, like storytellers of the community. They used to take their bones and they used to hollow out the tree and they would bury them in there. They were like normal burial sites. Up until the 90s, when Senghur like banned the practice, it was like late 90s, early 2000s, where he banned the practice due to the decomposing bodies and things like that not being safe. But um, the tree is used for like a lot of things and you find it everywhere. It's mostly, especially since Dakar, like I'm from Dakar, so it's like it's been developed. So you kind of have to go in the outskirts, you know, but Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fruit, the fruit also for juice. The fruit, it's buoy. I know. So exactly, I was thinking. Yeah. I was like, but I, this, there are things I already know. So I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but no, we make. Um, yeah, there's buoy. So I actually have it. Um, <laughs> delicious, by the way. It's very it good. Is. Juices yeah. out of it. They do. You can make little popsicles, but they do the same with like hibiscus. So like bisap. Yeah, right, bisap. Yeah. Right. So uh -huh. it's it's like a cultural norm for all of these things to be included in your meals. Um, yeah. Well, um, Rita, do you have a tree in Finland or a tree that you you um, would identify as sacred? And then we're going to come to one more question. I'm going to take it's it from the, Giovanni. Yeah, yeah, it's the bir birch tree. Birch, okay. Yes, that um, you know it is in our epic story. I mean, it's prevalent everywhere. Um, it's kind of like the tree of life there. It's mystical. It has a spirit. Ancient Finns believe there's. You know, a spirit that lived within that tree. Wow. It's also, it's also, uh, you know, it's it became known as sacred because I mean, there's so many uses for it. You know, the bark could be made for cups and utensils, and uh, and then you know, the like we use it in the sauna. And they make brooms out of it, so it's it's just viewed that way, and that's the one I would say. Mm -hmm. I think it, I'm going to ask everybody in the in the chat to put the tree that you have from where you are from that you think is sacred in the interest of time. And then I'm going to say from um, Giovanni Redmark, whom I have not heard from since eons. So we're going to read her question. Where is it now? I just lost it. She you says, are. you're all thoughtful and accomplished creators. It was a pleasure to see your works. You um, she said she's going to view your websites and she says happy Hanukkah, which I was going to see at the end of this. So with that, Alex, I also have a comment here. People think that you're an amazing moderator and translator. They have forgotten that you're from Guadeloupe. So you, you're not only a translator, you're a Frenchman. Right. <laughs> you're a Frenchman, a Guadeloupean. <laughs> And that's that's one of the reasons why we um, we actually love working with you as well. Uh, Amanda, how are we doing for time? Is it time for me to wrap up? We're doing. We're at eight oh three. So okay. yeah, but, and I've got so for the Zoom. Everybody make it make a big smile because I've got you. Yeah, all. can everybody yeah. turn on there so we can get a picture, please? I, I can't even see <laughs> everybody. I think I can't yeah. even see everybody in the on the screen. So look, look how we're pretty. Look, Polly. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, please. Roy, can you capture this on me? I don't know how to do it. Isaiah, can you capture that? Roy, Isaiah, Tanya? I got it, I got it. You got yeah. it. Listen, <laughs> listen, listen to me. I'm using Michelle's word when Michelle says, listen, <laughs> listen. We have been doing this work for 25 years. Deborah, Jack, your day on the call. Miss you. <laughs> Deborah just turned 50. Robbie Bell, uh, listen, listen. We've been doing this work for 25 years. We could not have done it without you. We know that and we feel it. The, the panelists that we have, they are like family. We met Yasin in, in DC and we just fell in love with her. Um, Rita and I go back to the Bakos. Bruna, we met in Guadeloupe the three times we were there and fell in love in many ways, right Bruno? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not telling a secret. We fell in love in so many ways to Bruna, the dancing and the food. Alex, but we, we are known as the 
magic connectors. Yeah. We have marriages. That's right. We have girlfriend. <laughs> we have what else? Children. Oh my God. <laughs> so you, listen, I am telling you, Kim has asked me to remind you. Kim, will you please remind them, everyone of our upcoming Zoom, please? Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, our next uh, tipping, tipping back, tilting forward is on January 7th. The theme is naming and justice. And we're going to highlight longtime uh, DVCI artist Rosa Dede Garmendia and um, uh, talking about artists who use and address race, uh, micro and macro aggressions toward people of color. So join us on January 7th, we'll make sure the invites. And I'm jumping in. I'm gonna say congratulations to you, Rosie and everybody. Um, it's been such an exciting month and I'm so glad that we get to share these incredible artists with our entire community. So uh, thank you and that's all I'm gonna say. Well, I wanna thank you. Today was a special day for us, the Knight Foundation um, with their Rosa help me with their, what is, what is Texas? The Knight Foundation with their um, Knight Challenge Award. Um, the award is two awardees, um, Jean Moreno from ICA Museum and Shanna Sheldon from MOCA selected DVCAI as their recipients of $10,000 each. Oh, Both, our new board chair, Tanya Dedunes is on the call. This money we are going to use to archive and document our collection. We've had uh, 25 years of art and we have to make sure that there's a living archive. That's what we teach. And then we're going to do a strategic plan. So we're gonna call on some of your expertise to assist us so we can last, they say for another 25 years, I will not be here, but Tanya and all the young people that will be here to serve you a plate. Michelle Parchment, I know you hate when I do this. You are one of the sponsors of this Zoom. We pay our artists to give us the talent and expertise that they have. And we cannot do it without support. And Michelle has been really, really amazing. So Mish, don't kill me after the call. Thank you for underwriting the translation of this Zoom. And we, there are many opportunities for you to do this in the future. We're going to close down for Christmas, folks. Yeah, yeah quelqu'un qui n'a pas compris. OK? I mean, not okay. Oui, oui, ça va? <laughs> Céline. <laughs> I'm such an illiterate. I'm such an illiterate. Uh, uh, Alex, help me. What did she say, well, Alex? Somebody did not understand, you know, what you just said. Oui, oui. Non, mais franchement, elle a juste dit merci à tout le monde. Elle, elle, they received two awards. Je ne sais pas comment on dit ça. We received two awards from the Knight Foundation via um, two organizations, ICA, which is a museum here in the design district, and MOCA. Okay. And MOCA is a museum in North Miami that serves predominantly our Haitian community. And Amanda mm -hmm. is the director of education. So it, listen, guys, it takes a village to do this. And so we want to thank you. Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah, happy Kwanzaa. Um, treat each other well. We deserve some joy. Danny, is that you smiling at me from Miami Beach? Uh, we deserve we deserve to have joy and bliss. Find it somewhere. Find somebody to hug. Daniel, I'm just seeing you. <laughs> Guys, thank you, thank you. Thank Deb, you. have a happy 50th year. Where is thank Sarah? You. Sarah, where are you? With your little pumpkin. <laughs> Liza, we love you guys so much. Patrona from Jamaica. Who is there? We can't see anybody. Else. If I didn't call your name, it's not because we don't love you. It's because Celine, I just saw you. How are you? And Rudy, Rudy Mark, where are you? From Guadeloupe. Kurt, Harry, where are you there? From Suriname. Kiss my picnic them for me, okay? Folks. <laughs> Jagaid and bless, we cannot do this without you. Thank you, all of you who donated this year to us. If you find a little money between Thank now you. and the new year, write a check. Go to the website and you will see donate and you, we would really appreciate it. Rosa, we look forward to seeing you over the holidays to start the year, um, January 7th with the Zoom. Good night, everyone.
Thank you so much. Thank you to my son and family.